At around 11 p.m. on November 8, 2016, the Canadian government's immigration website crashed as over 200,000 Americans scrambled to find refuge. While moving to a new country may sound like an adventure, it's actually the easy way out when compared to the alternative. Starting your own country. Welcome to the wonderful world of micronations. Basically, a micronation is a country that really insists it's a country, but no other country agrees with it as such. Micronations are as varied as they are plentiful, some existing in physical space, like the island nation of North Dumpling, others in outer space, some solely online, and others in a purely metaphysical space. Many boast their own passports, flags, constitutions, and supreme leaders. Plus, with great names like Wallachia, Zakistan, and Wangamamona, who wouldn't want to visit? But while it may be easy to dismiss these nations as nothing more than self-aggrandizing pet projects, Time Magazine of December 25th, 2015 argues that there is much more to these than just role-playing and status flagging. Some are erected as forms of protest, like in the Coral Sea Islands, founded to protest Australia's gay marriage laws. Others are clever ways of, of exploiting legal loopholes, like the Principality of Hutt River, a technically unincorporated province of Australian land that declared independence in 1970 and promptly stopped paying taxes. Micronations occupy a territory on the periphery of our understanding. In tackling these quirky countries, we recognize the prerequisite questions. What is a nation? How does a nation gain legitimacy? And most importantly, how do I make my own? As citizens of Trump's America, these questions have never seemed more relevant. By exploring the nature, nature of micronations, creating our own, and discussing implications therein, we declare independence on our own terms. Zealand is the world's most famous micronation, erected on a defensive platform off the coast of the United Kingdom. Zealand has its own flag and passports and even sells titles of nobility. That's right, for the low price of $29.99, you too can be a lord or lady, peasants to lord over not included. Our background includes statehood and recognition. Though as Americans we often use these terms interchangeably, nations and states are actually two separate things. Nation is easier to define. A collection of people who share a common identity, culture, religion, or background. Though nations often have states, they don't always. For example, the Kurds of the Middle East, a distinct group of people with a common identity who do not have a state. And although unrest continues to rack the Middle East and Kurdish statehood does seem to be a possibility, the problem remains that not everyone agrees on the definition of state. Fortunately, on December 26, 1933, the International Conference of American States set out to do just that. In what became known as the Montevideo Convention, the ICAS established four criteria for statehood. First, a permanent population, then a defined territory, then governance, and lastly, the ability to enter into relations with other states. Sounds simple, right? Well, it's actually too simple. The Montevideo criteria fails to touch on a critical aspect of statehood, recognition. Recognition from other states is what gives a nation legitimacy. This is where most micronations fail to meet the mark. Currently, no micronation has gained international recognition. That's because recognition is not a legal process, it's a political one. The Los Angeles Times on December 12, 2016 gives us an example. When President Trump acknowledged Taiwan as independent from China, he broke with a long-standing American legal fiction. When the communists originally came power into China, America refused to acknowledge the PRC as real China instead acknowledging Taiwan. This held true until Richard Nixon, who acknowledged the PRC as the first step in easing relations, because recognition is a political tool. There are some nations who exist in an unfortunate limbo called partial recognition, where some countries recognize them and others continue to pretend that they don't exist. You've probably heard of Palestine, but maybe not Abkhazia or the Pridnestrovian Moldavian Republic. These countries are even barred from orga joining organizations like FIFA, so they hold their own World Cup, this year in Abkhazia. So now that we've learned a little bit about what a nation is, it's time to make our own. We're following in the footsteps of those who came before us, like the Principality of Saborga, the oldest micronation. Saborga is a small town in southern Italy that's claim to independence dates back to 954. The Italian government, of course, finds these claims preposterous. Let's get started. First, we need a collection of people with a common identity, such as this round. States are formed around groups who share a single identity. We'll call ourselves forensicans or species at informal events. That's our permanent population. 
No opt-outs. Next, we need to define territory. I think this room will do nicely. That, then we need governance. Now, the Montevideo criteria didn't specify a type of government, merely governance in general. So, any suggestions? Ah, yes, a representative monarchy. Great idea. Now, if someone could just send the State Department an email and let them know that we've declared ourselves independent, we'll have met the Montevideo criteria. So, we're a state, right? Not quite. There remains the problem of recognition. Fortunately, micronations recognize each other. The Brussels Times on December 12, 2016 talks about Polynation 2015, held in Umbria, Italy. Micronations from around the world send delegations, usually their founders, to consort with other micronationalists, journalists, and scholars. Not all nations in attendance desire statehood, though. In the case of the Grand Duchy of Flandernesis, their founder laid claim to a series of islands off the coast of Antarctica, not as an egotistical stunt, but to draw attention to an ecological disaster currently underway. Currently underway. Other nations in attendance were more artistic, such as Zakistan. Zakistan, situated in Box Elder County, Utah, was founded by artist Zachary Landberg as a means to test physical space. Lieberland is a three square mile piece of no man's land situated between Croatia and Serbia that where taxes are voluntary, laws are minimal, and the economy runs on virtual currency. The new statesman of June 10th, 2016 argues that Lieberland is Lieberland, the newest micronation, is riding a wave of international dissatisfaction with government as usual that has led it to an impressive half a million citizens at a rate of 500 new applications per day. This sheds light on our new implications, that of physical space and political realism. First, micronations are an unspoken affirmation of political realism. In international relations, political realism is the belief that at their core, international actors are motivated by self-interest. In, under a realist understanding, political laws and regulations across the globe internationally are moot because there is because the international arena is inherently anarchic. There is no supranational power with the ability to enforce laws beyond the smallest amount of resistance. Micronations are irrelevant not because they want to be or are intended to be, but because the political realism demands it. Micronations have no power. They have no standing army or means to defend themselves. So while they may meet all the legal check marks, they lack the power to give those laws meaning. Ultimately, even in the world of the United Nations, The Hague, and the World Trade Organization, might still makes right. Lastly, micronations shed light on our complicated relationship with physical space. Though Forensica may have declared itself the sole arbitrator of Hui's room, I suspect Ball State University will have something to say about it. But why do we need physical space? Nations have populations scattered across the globe in what are called diasporas. This includes groups like the Romani, the Druze, and until the creation of Israel, the Jews. So if nations don't need physical space, why do states? Perhaps it's simple. Maybe throughout all of human history, we simply haven't come up with a better way to organize ourselves. Or have we? The Chicago Tribune on December 12, 2016 ruminates on the Paris Agreement, an international conference of states, an international conference of states with the goal of combating climate change except there were more than just sovereign states at the negotiating table. There were cities, provinces, and even transnational corporations circumventing the traditional group state hierarchy. Perhaps as globalization and technology draws our world closer together, the state will eventually lose its relevance. To some extent, it already has. Sovereign states have struggled in the global conflict against terrorism, not because they lack the military means to fight terrorism, but because terrorism cannot be fought like a traditional state, because it lacks physical space. Today, we dove into the wonderful world of micronations. We explored the real world concepts of nations and statehood, and even forged a nation of our own. We discussed implications on physical space and international recognition that elucidate the reality of the international arena. My fellow forensicans, it has been a pleasure. Meep.